My name's Darius Magata, and today I'm talking about the buy and sell business. Now, I've been a collector of various things probably since the age of about four or five, and I would guess I've got about ten years buying and selling experience now. Um, basically, I'll buy anything if I think I can sell it, and I'll buy anything if I like it, even if everybody tells me that I can't sell it, I'll still buy it, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm surrounded with stuff. Um, Where do I go to buy? I go to flea markets, I go to garage sales, I go to estate sales, I go to auctions, I pick stuff up. I, 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 Where do I go to buy? I go to flea markets, I go to garage sales, I go to estate cleanouts, I go to auctions, I pick stuff up. Damn. Where do I go to buy? I go to flea markets, I go to garage sales, I go to estate cleanouts, I go to auctions, I go to thrift stores, I pick stuff up from the side of the road for free, um, I buy online, locally and internationally, um, whatever it takes to get those items that I can make money on, I'll do that. Um, I always say that you do what must be done, so if that means going hours away driving or paying three times the price of an item for shipping rates or doing whatever you have to do to get it in, that's what I'll do. Basically, the goal is to get things as... No, oh, it's already... I've already said basically. I don't want to say that again. The goal is always to get things as cheaply as possible, because I want to maximize the amount of money that I can make on any given item. Um, usually my rule is that I don't like to pay more than half of what I think I can sell something for, and I don't like to sell things for their full book value or eBay price or whatever. I try to have the lowest price out there because I I need to get things really cheap so that I can sell them cheap and sell them at a price that I think would be fair for me to buy at. So I don't like to ask more for an item than I would be willing to pay for it. And that means I have to get things for a lot less than I'd be willing to necessarily give. Uh, that said, there's been times where I've paid as much or more as I think I can sell something for just because I want to have the privilege of saying that I have sold it. Um, I've bought books and bit documents, bits of paper that were hundreds of years old, um, and I've overpaid for them. Um, just for the sake of being able to say, an item like this came through me. Um, because there's certain, certain items that if you deal in them, it makes you look good as a dealer. There's a few... When am I going to say this? There's a few rules that I have personally for how I like to do business. Um, when I'm buying, if I see something that's for sale at a reasonable price, I don't negotiate. Um, if something's for sale and you're asking a decent, reasonable amount for it, I'll give you that amount. I don't need to nickel and dime everybody down as low as I can in order to make my money, so I don't do that. Um,
I don't usually buy reproductions or fakes of anything, certainly not to sell. Um, I do have some examples of items in my own collection that are not original, but I don't like to deal in them. Uh, because for one thing, it opens you up to a lot of possible problems, and they're also just not as easy to sell, uh, because people who are real collectors want to have original, authentic items when possible. I also, as much as possible, stay away from dealing in modern household kind of goods. Um, I know some people that are in this business that focus exclusively on that, and I say more power to them, but for me, every time I end up with those things, I lose a lot of money, so I'd, I've uh, given up on that. I don't take them on purpose anymore. However, there are those times that any buyer will tell you about where you end up with a whole mess of different stuff and you've got to do something with it. Uh, so I find myself making a lot of trips to the Goodwill myself to donate back items that I've bought because uh, in fact I need to make a trip to the Goodwill today in order to make room for the stuff I've bought yesterday. Uh, that's just how it goes. Nothing you can do. There has to be constant turnover. You always have to be selling the stuff that you have and bringing in new stuff. Because you want to have repeat customers. You want to have people that will depend on you. They know that if they're looking for a certain item, they can call you up and say, Hey, do you have this or can you find me this? I'll say yes or no. Um, any more often it's emails than calls, but uh, nobody really calls me. But there's that, and also when you're selling at yard sales or you're selling at the flea market, as I do both of those things, people aren't going to come in and stop and visit if they see that it looks like it's all the same stuff as it was last time they were there. I certainly don't do that. If, if I go to the flea market and I see a booth that doesn't look like there's anything new in it from the last time I've seen it, I walk right by. So I have to have turnover. And that means that as quickly as the money comes in, it's going back out because I'm buying new items and bringing them in, getting them listed online, taking them to the flea market. I'm, I'm in contact with people that are collectors of more specialized items. I know people that collect local history. I know people that collect milk bottles. I know people that collect beer cans. I know people that collect classic rock records. If I get any, any kind of specific item, Chances are I know somebody that might want to buy it right then and there. I can get in touch with them and find out. And if they don't, then it goes into the inventory, which is basically what you see uh, surrounding me here. And I do my best to sell it. People have a lot of misconceptions about being in the antiques and collectibles business because you have so many TV shows like American Pickers and uh, all those kind of spin-offs and Pawn Stars and things like that that drive up the prices of items because they make it seem as if every old rusty old thing that you find out in your grandfather's shed could make you a fortune and that's true Every item that you find in that circumstance, it, it does have the potential to make you a lot of money. But 99% of the antique and vintage items that are out there are not really worth anything. And people don't know that. And when I say not worth anything, I don't mean, I don't mean completely worthless, but I mean they're not worth putting on a TV show. Maybe I can get $2, $5, $10 even for things. Um, but the vast majority of stuff is not really worth any more than that. So it's becoming harder and harder to find decent prices on antiques, especially when I go to estate sales and things like that. And people's parents or grandparents or other relatives have amassed these huge collections of cups and saucers, let's say. And it must be worth a fortune, right? Because they're antiques. But it just it doesn't sell. I, I mean, I don't even I don't even deal in uh, in China and porcelain and all that anymore because 
I can't sell it. It's not worth anything. Unless you get that one in a hundred or one in a thousand or more piece that might bring you a hundred bucks for a cup and saucer. But is that worth waiting through hundreds and hundreds of worthless ones? No. I, I have my expertise in certain areas. There's certain things that I know about. I know a lot about records. I can, generally, I can look at a record and tell you uh, approximately what the price is that it would go for. Especially Reggae and Calypso, that's my stuff. Um, I know a lot about old movies. I know a lot about old paper and ephemera. I know stamps, I know coins. I know gold and silver and copper and bronze melt values. And then there's unusual things, because whenever I am out shopping and I see an item and I don't know what it is, I find out for the next time. Because in order to really be successful in this business, you have to know as much as there is to know. You need to be able to walk into a room full of 50-year-old items, or more, and look at this and this and this and say, this is what it was used for, this is where it was made, this is when it was made, and this is how much it's worth. Because if you don't know that, everyone else will beat you to the punch. You have to be able, if you're the first one on the scene inspecting these items, you have to be able to know what's worth going for, because there is so much competition. And everybody else in this business has got more money than me. So, I've got to be on the top of my game all the time, and I've got to know everything that there is to know as much as possible, or else I can't make a buck, because someone else is going to grab it right out from under my nose, take it up to Toronto and sell it for a fortune at the antique markets, and there'd be nothing I could do about it. So, over the years, I've learned what I've learned, and I find it's enough to get me by, but I'm always picking up more knowledge. And basically, uh, oh, I just said basically again. <laughs> the final point that I really want to make is that you can't be in this business if you don't enjoy it. It's not all about the money. And I, I know people that have tried to get into dealing in antiques and collectibles and records and whatever just for the money, because they see it seems like easy money, they want a piece of the pie. But it can't be done. You have to love and you have to appreciate these kind of items, or else you won't make it. I love antiques, I love collectibles, I am a collector myself. And that's why I have some of the best rates of turnover of items. There's antique stores in this city that don't get in as much new merchandise every day and every week as I do. Because I'm going at it with a collector's taste. I buy items that I think are cool. I buy items that I want. If I don't want it for myself, I don't buy it, because then I'm at risk. If I can't sell something, and I get stuck with it, I want it to be something that I like, and I look at it and I say, oh well, I'll keep it for myself. If I go around buying items that I have no interest in, it's too much of a risk, because if I get stuck with those, then I'm really stuck with them. And I'm going to end up taking them over for donation and losing all my money. And unfortunately, that's what happens. Uh, a lot of antique stores around here go out of business because they're run by people who don't really know what it is that they have, and they don't really appreciate what it is that they have. They're just buying and selling because they want to put money in their pocket. Yes, the money is important. If the money wasn't important, then I wouldn't sell anything, and I would have my own episode of Hoarders by now. But the money is important, but the money isn't the number one thing. The appreciation for what you're doing is the number one thing. Some people work at Tim Hortons, some people work at, you know, sit-down restaurants as waiters, 
Some people drive cars for Uber. I buy and sell old stuff, and I love it. That's how I make my money, and I do well with it. So, I'm going to keep going till I can't do it anymore. And even in that relatively short amount of time that I've been collecting, I say relatively short because 10 years is more than half of my life, but there's people who've been in the, doing it for 50 or 60 or 70 years. So I say relatively short because of that. But in this relatively short amount of time that I've been collecting, I have seen so many dealers, vendors, and antique store owners in this area go in and out of business. They start, they last for a little while, and they stop. I've never stopped. I started doing the buy and sell thing, and I've just kept going with it, and I find new ways to do it. I find new items that I've never handled before, new categories that I've never been in, and I jump right into it. If I think there's an opportunity to make some money, I'll go for it. You can't get stuck doing the same old things. It's just like any other business, any kind of company, and I do look at myself, basically, as my own company. Any kind of company, you have to come in with fresh new ideas and new products that you can provide, and you have to go about promoting them to people in new ways. It's exactly the same for this, and it's exactly the same for me. And people ask me, you know, don't you ever lose money, and don't you ever get discouraged when you get stuck with it? You know, they, they want to know if I've ever taken a risk and gotten burned. Well, of course I have. I've, I've taken lots of kind of wild guesses on items that I've bought, and I've lost money. And I've bought items that I was sure I could make a killing on, only to find out that they were reproductions. I got, I had a lot of reproductions when I was just starting off with the real antiques. I took in a lot of reproductions and fake old stuff, and uh, I lost some money on that. It's risky. It is risky in several ways. You can end up with items that you can't sell. You can end up with items that are illegal to sell. I know people have gotten into that situation. You can get scammed by people selling to you, you can get scammed by people buying from you. I've had stuff stolen from me at my flea market booths and at yard sales and that. I've had people that have stolen from me, yes. But there's no fun in doing this if there's no risk. And I, I think that the more I have at stake in any item, yes, the more nerve-wracking it is and the more stressful it is for me until I can sell it. But when I do, it's so much more fun to finish up that deal and get it done and, and get it out and make some money on it. It, it just makes it more fun. It, it really is like a game. You have to know how to play the game, you have to enjoy playing the game, and you can't be afraid to play the game. But if you can check all those off your list and you still want to do it, there is so much money to be made and there is so much fun to be had. I'm proof of that. I've made a lot of money. I've had a lot of fun, I'm still making money and I'm still having fun, and I'll be doing it for a lot of years to come. Now, what I was saying earlier is that I've got to clear a lot of stuff out of here to fit in the stuff that I bought yesterday. So, I'm going to do a little bit of a tour of what this is, and there's way more than you can see in this camera frame here. There's way more. And then, the good part, I'll show off the stuff I bought yesterday, out there. Nice seat, isn't it? Yeah. 
the storage room. I come here a lot. So this is the merchandise, or at least some of the merchandise. It's in a bit of a disarray. Um, in there is where I was sitting. You can see how tight it is. But this is my storage area. So whenever I buy something that I don't want in the space where I'm living, this is where it comes. We'll take a look at what's in here. We got this etched glass advertising mirror. That's a good piece. Unfortunately, nobody knows it's worth anything, so I can't sell it. Double Skittles, big board game. Lots of records under here. That's where the records are. Records are some of my best and some of my worst sellers. That was a gift for someone. Records are some of my best and some of my worst sellers. Uh, I say that because the items that I've made the most money on in all my time buying and selling have been records. I've sold records for close to a thousand US dollars on the internet. Um, and I regularly get 10, 20, 50, even 100 for some. But the problem with records is that the ones that aren't worth anything really aren't worth anything. Nobody wants them. And there's a lot of people selling records right now because records are the hot item. So if you're going to sell them, you got to be selling good ones. This is a great album here from Trinidad, but nobody knows it, so I can't even get a dollar for it. What a shame. But there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with a lot of these records. This is one of my dollar bins here. There's nothing wrong with this stuff. It's fine music, but they're just not worth anything. So nobody wants to buy them. Look, what do we have here? Heavy haulers? I could use a heavy hauler like that to bring stuff in here. Overloaded diesel. Yeah. My car is pretty overloaded. I don't drive a diesel though. Anyway. Beautiful antique phone from Switzerland. It's worth about $500, but again, nobody knows that, so I can't sell it. This cabinet here has got a stove in the top. I always say that whenever I move out, I'm going to bring it with me and use it to cook my food on. Probably will kill me faster, but at least it'll save me the money of buying a new stove. And of course, it's full of stuff. I got beer cans with every Olympic Games on them. You know, Occupy Japan. All kinds of stuff in there. Speakers. Always speakers. They're worthless. Speaking of worthless, it's an old phone, but not quite as old as that one there. And there's other electronics back here too. There's some kind of tape recorder. That's a 16 millimeter projector, an 8 millimeter projector. Unfortunately, stuff's just not worth much. There's some mannequins. One's white and one's black. It's like the two halves of me. Only I haven't got... Uh... Well, never mind what I have and haven't. Boxes and boxes of miscellaneous stuff. You can see some of the old tins. Masks, the birdhouse, milk cartons, cigar boxes, all sorts of paper, ephemera, there's some Star Wars sheet music. I mean, I've got a little bit of everything. Checkerboard table, collector spoon display case, weightlifters belts, wooden crates, I've got lots of them. Not quite as many as I used to have though, I sold a lot. Some kind of big brass pitcher. Everyone keeps telling me it's a hookah pipe, but it's not. Envelopes. I bought a huge collection of 78 RPM records. If you don't know what those are, Google it. And every one of them was numbered in these brown envelopes. And every envelope, this one doesn't have it, every envelope had a smaller envelope inside it. There it is. 
with the same number written on it. That's where they were from. Unfortunately, when I bought the collection, I didn't get a listing of what the numbering meant or what the order was, so I had to undo the many hours of sorting that somebody clearly did. And I ended up throwing most of them in the garbage anyway. And I broke some. That's, uh, you know. Coleman Cooler, that's a classic from the 70s. I got aliens in here. It's just like Fort Knox or whatever. China cups and saucers. That's one thing I don't buy. But this is actually a box of tax returns originally. That's a gramophone horn. Pot. Used to have more pot. I had three of these, but now I've just got one and sold the others. Pepsi Cola sign. These are all screen print blocks. Oh, this is one of my favorite. I'm a Loretta Lynn fan. I'm really not. I set up this video watching station down here. Plugs into the ceiling. All kinds of videotapes. Mostly because I have too many videotapes in my own room. I didn't have room for these ones up there. There's a turntable that I can't sell because it's missing some of the pieces. Chinese checkers. Lots of board games and stuff. Chill out, this is great. That's amazing. One thing I really don't like buying, anything with Charles and Diana. But uh, just recently, I ended up with a bunch of old tabloid magazines from 1997 when she died, and somebody gave me a dollar piece for them, amazingly. So I guess the stuff's not as hard to sell as I thought it was, but still not something I'm gonna really choose to deal in. There's some CEDs. It's a video disc inside this plastic case. This is actually the last video format that I can't play because I don't have a player for it. I have everything else but I don't have that because they're so unreliable that all the ones I've ever found were broken. Old TV, playing Atari games on. These are fake CDs. These are from a video store to put on display. This is the latest release, Airplane. That's a good one. I don't have it on CD though, for real. Escape from Alcatraz. Super Bowl. Airplane again. These are better movies than the ones I've actually got down there. Nobody's ever heard of those movies. The Ladies Curl Master. It's a curling broom. Worth $100 on the internet, not worth $5 here. Old saws. I've gotten into the saw business because there was a company in St. Catharines that used to make them and they're very valuable. This is not one of theirs. Lots of honey tins and cigarette tins. These are, these are a tough sell, but when you find someone to buy it, you get good money for it. These I don't think anybody will buy. Dog food. Ninja Turtles basketball net. $200 item. US dollars on eBay. But I can't sell it. Lots of stuff. There's a big old wooden toboggan made here in Ontario. In this bag here is an African drum. That's a light fixture. Now this here, I've got to confess, I've already unloaded some of the stuff from yesterday. This thing, I, did, I had to make a drive out to St. Catharines today for school and I didn't want this thing in my car. It's a fat shaker machine. Plug this into the wall. You step in here and put this around your gut or around your hips or whatever. Turn it on. These things just spin around and it shakes, shakes the pad and it helps you lose weight, or so they thought back in the 50s. One of these was on Storage Wars one time. I think it was said to be worth a few hundred dollars back then. This cost me ten dollars, and it works. So I couldn't resist. And we're still not done, though, because there's always more. 
There's the tripod. Hey. More 16 millimeter projectors, both of them. Those are the shelves I use for the flea market. There's a big old stereo stand. More speakers. Stuff doesn't end, you know? All coin collecting supplies. So you can pretty much tell, I don't know what I'm gonna end up with, but I take it all.
that's it. So all this is the result of one day's shopping at the auction. And this is not even everything, because it also included the exercise machine and the chair that I was sitting in before. All this cost a total of $127. And uh, truth be told, I don't even know what's in some of these boxes yet. That's all the fun. So I'm going to go through it, bring the best stuff upstairs, and put the rest of it where it needs to go. Here's some stuff that's been singled out for donation. I don't like to ever give up on trying to sell certain things, but uh, eventually there comes a time where I've had it for long enough, I've listed it in enough places and taken it to enough places where people could see it, that it just has to go. We got the collector's spoon rack, Coleman cooler, birdhouse, phone, lots of 78 RPM records down there. Some not so great pictures. Unfortunately, saying goodbye to chill out. Charles and Diana. And a box of miscellaneous kitchenware. That's the kind of stuff that I really can't sell. So the best thing to do with it is just get it out of here to make more space. Even if it means taking a small loss.